Songs for love so my heart thirsts for you. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And when shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him and my help and my God. My soul is cast down within me, and therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mizar, deep calls to deep at the thunder of your cataracts. All your waves and your billows have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you got forgotten me? Why must I walk about mournfully because the enemy oppresses me? As with a deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me continually, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall praise him once again, my help and my God. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From those who are deceitful and unjust, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you cast me off? Why must I walk about mournfully because of the oppression of the enemy? O oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the harp, O oh God, my God. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. He runs the, the scripture for the people of God.
Thank you, all of you. That was pure joy. <laughs> Our gospel reading this morning comes from Luke, chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. Listen to the word of the Lord. Then Jesus and the disciples arrived at the region of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As Jesus stepped out on shore, a man from the city who had demons met him. For a long time, he had not worn any clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, shouting, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? He said, Legion. For many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now, there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd stampeded down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. And then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they became frightened. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then the whole throng of people of the surrounding region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and he returned. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged that he might be with Jesus, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks God. God. <laughs> Jesus' disciples may be in one of those phases of ministry when they're wondering whether they really want to continue this whole following Jesus thing. Because Jesus is totally unpredictable and his power is terrifying. They had just been in a boat with Jesus and there was this huge windstorm so bad that their boat was filling with water and they were saying their prayers. They thought they might die, but Jesus rebuked the wind and rebuked the waves and suddenly they stopped. Suddenly there was no wind and the water was calm. They were terrified, not of the storm anymore, but of the one who stopped it. Who is this Jesus that he can command the wind and the waves and they will obey him? Things don't get any more comfortable when the disciples get to shore because Jesus has decided to take them into Gentile territory for the first time. 
The disciples, of course, are all Jewish. And first century Jews don't spend time with Gentiles. The term Gentile includes everybody who's not Jewish. This is not done. Gentiles are unclean people. They are presumed to be outside of God's favor. Gentiles are the kind of people that young children are warned to stay away from. It's an ingrained prejudice learned from a young age. So the disciples are probably anxious as soon as they realize that they are in the wrong neighborhood. And then as soon as they set foot on Gentile land, they are met with a very big, strong, naked man running toward them. It is immediately evident that this man is full of demons. If we saw him today, we would probably assume that he had a debilitating mental illness. He is not well. As it turns out, he hasn't worn clothes for a long time. And he hasn't lived in a house either. He has lived in the tombs among the dead. The government has tried to do what they see fit when it comes to demonized people, binding him in chains and shackles with a guard, but he's big and strong, and so they can't control him. And so when the demons take over, he breaks the chains and shackles and runs back to the tombs. So you can imagine what this man looks like, bruised from chains and shackles, bruised from fighting the police who keep dragging him from his tombs back to the jail. You can imagine how he smells living in the tombs. You can imagine how he moves with his body, not always under his own control, and the look in his eyes with voices that are not his own screaming in his head all day. And so this man, perhaps hearing that Jesus is coming to town or perhaps just running from the police again to avoid getting locked up, he runs toward the shore. And before he says a word, Jesus commands the demons to come out of him. Jesus' very first move in this territory on the wrong side of the lake, this land presumed to be outside of God's favor, is to favor the least favored of them all. One so embarrassing and scary to the Gentiles that they spend their money locking him up to keep him out of sight. And if things hadn't gotten weird so far, they get weirder. The demons immediately realize who Jesus is. Human beings don't always know this, but the demons know immediately that they are dealing with somebody who is stronger than them. And so using the man's voice, they shout at him saying, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. And Jesus enters into a conversation with the demons. He asks, what is your name? And they say, legion. A legion is a unit of the Roman army containing five to 6,000 men, which suggests the number of demons who have taken over this man. And it may also speak to the oppressive Roman government in that region that was demonizing the population. And these legion pleaded with Jesus. They begged him not to send them back to the abyss, which is thought to be a bottomless pit reserved for God's enemies. And they asked if instead they could enter a large herd of swine that was feeding on a hilltop nearby. And Jesus gave them permission. And so the demons came out of the man and went up the hill and entered the swine and the whole herd stampeded down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. What? <laughs> I, I've had such a hard time with this story since the first time I heard it. 
It is a terrible example of what having dominion over the animals looks like. <laughs> this is profoundly unfair to the pigs. <laughs> there they are, just feeding on the hillside like they do every day, doing their pig thing. And suddenly Jesus, the savior of the world, allows demons to enter them. And I don't know, the pigs are so traumatized by this that they go into fight or flight mode and just start running in fear, trying to get away from the demons without realizing where they're going before it's too late. Or maybe the demons lead the pigs into the water and drown them, but that doesn't make sense because demons, at least as they were understood, need bodies to express themselves, so presumably they need the pigs alive. I don't know. But whatever happened, it's really not fair to the pigs, who are just living their best pig life on the top of the hill feeding. Now, I acknowledge that this would have been heard very differently to the original audience who heard this story. Pigs were considered unclean animals. And so therefore, to a first century Jewish audience, it is fitting that Jesus would allow unclean spirits to go into unclean animals. They belong together. Just as I might not have such a hard time with this story if instead of picturing a hillside of cute little Wilburs and babes, it was a herd of spiders or a herd of mosquitoes. We all have creatures that we could probably do without. We don't see all creatures created equal. And so in the first century, the fate of the pigs would not have been a distraction as it is to me. <laughs> but the fate of the pigs would have been a distraction in a different way, which some say is precisely the point of the story. There were swine herds who owned these pigs, who made their living off of these pigs. And so when the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran off and told the community, and people came to see for themselves, and what did they see? A man who had had demons, who was certainly known around town, was suddenly clothed and in his right mind. He had been healed. He was no longer unclean. He was able to be fully restored to the community, free of the chains and the shackles. But instead of celebrating and rejoicing with this man, the people were terrified and asked Jesus to leave. The man with demons was as good as dead. He literally lived in tombs, and Jesus had brought him to life. But the community decided that it cost too much. And his life wasn't really worth it. He really didn't matter that much. I mean, presumably he didn't work. He didn't have a job. He just hung out at the tombs, probably shouting obscenities and talking to himself. His presence probably scared people who were trying to visit their family members' graves. And when he wasn't there, he was costing the community money because he was getting locked up with guards. Why is this guy worth saving? And now, you have the significant economic loss of the pigs. And there's also the cost of the community's comfort. When a man was full of demons, they knew what to expect. It was uncomfortable. But the police did their best they could to keep him locked up. And when he escaped, the people could just avoid the tombs until it was taken care of. Everybody knew the roads to avoid. And now that this man is healed, the status quo is disrupted. No one knows what's going to happen next. Is he really healed? Can we trust him? Can he hold up a job? Are the demons gone for good? Are different people going to be demonized now? Nobody knows. And the community decides that this healing costs too much. And the emotional discomfort of the unknown is too scary. And they ask Jesus to leave, and he does. But he leaves a witness. The man who had been demonized wants to go with Jesus, but Jesus tells him no. 
Jesus tells him that he is no longer to live in the tombs. He is no longer to live among the dead. Instead, he is to go to his home and he is to declare how much God has done for him. This is not going to be easy. The man used to scare people because he was filled with demons. But now he scares people because he stands for unknown power that can turn the world upside down. The Revised Common Lectionary, which assigns the scripture readings for churches, is used around the world on a three-year cycle. It's totally disconnected from national holidays because it's used in nations around the world, which each have different holidays. And its focus is, of course, on making sure the story of the church gets told and not the story of any one nation. And so I find it so interesting that the lectionary happened to assign this particular passage on what happens to be Juneteenth. Because I think that there's probably no more profound example of economic loss and fear of the unknown justifying the status quo, justifying the demonic, justifying the presence of evil than the enslavement of African Americans in this country. And there's no more fitting day for us to hear this story and consider the ways that we as a nation, as a community, as individuals, continue to justify injustice in the name of what it will cost us. And justify injustice in the name of our discomfort and fear of the unknown. And there's also no more fitting day for us to remember that we worship a God who is merciful, even and especially toward the marginalized and the oppressed. Those who are seen as outsiders, those who live on the wrong side of the lake, who are considered to be outside of God's favor. Jesus died the most shameful death you could die in first century Jerusalem. The death of the worst of criminals, of the people who get locked up. Jesus died at the hands of those whose justified injustice in the name of economic loss, he died. And in the name of their emotional discomfort and fear of the unknown that he brought with him. But while he was dying the shameful death, while he was hanging beside two criminals on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And God did. God forgave them just as today he continues to forgive all of us for all of these ways that we justify injustice in the name of what it will cost us and justify injustice in the name of our own discomfort and fear. And by virtue of this forgiveness, we are washed clean of all of it. Our sinful self has died and we have been given a new life, a brand new start. Not so that we can keep things the way that we are, but so that we are free to do something new with God. Free to be like our Father who forgives. Free to love and to fight for the marginalized and oppressed. Free to risk everything, free to risk our whole herd of pigs, whatever our whole herd of pigs is, we are free to risk it and to turn the world upside down for those who live on the wrong side of the lake. And we can know that when we do this, we are following in the footsteps of Jesus, following in the footsteps of the one whom our Father has sent, who is always fighting for the least of these whom he loves. 
The question is, will we listen to Jesus? Will we go back to our homes and declare all that God has done is and continues to do? It's up to us. We don't have to listen. But it is our invitation. And it is our calling. Amen. I invite you to join with me now in reciting our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. Please stand as you are able. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us join together in our hymn of affirmation number 778, As Pants the Deer for Living Streams. Particular joys 
or concerns that folks would like to lift up. We will, of course, pray for all of our fathers and father figures. But other joys, concerns, yeah. This, I think, is a happy announcement. Two members of your family reached a milestone yesterday. Bose and Jenny were married 62 years. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> there will be a mission sewing meeting Tuesday uh, from 10 to 2. We hope any of you who have not ever been will come and join us. We would love to have you come. You do not have to sew. <laughs> As we end the program year, Thanksgiving for our leader in music, Carol Houghton all that she does for us, even during the service while she's trying to connect us back to the inner web and all those kinds of things. We give praise and thanksgiving for her loving leadership to all of us. And I will say right back at you to all the choir, the choir, the bell choir, you guys really, um, you know, I've said it many times, you just fulfill me and you make this service meaningful, you make meaning in my life personally, because I love you all dearly, and you bring such um, a ministry to this, this congregation, and I appreciate it. I thank you very, 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 very much. Thank you. Thanks. One more thing, I didn't hear the piano mentioned, but the pianist is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> that that is a my bad because Marianne, this partnership that we have. <laughs> thank you. God bless all the fathers today. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. All right, let us pray. And as we pray, as we did last week, we will pray responsibly so that at the end of each petition, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you are invited to respond. Hear our prayer. Oh God, you formed Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed your holy breath into his lungs, giving all of us the gift of life. Breathe again your life into us, your children and your church, that we might be one with you and breathe new life into this world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. As the children of Israel found themselves slaves, making bricks for Pharaoh until you brought them to freedom. We pray for all in this world who are in trouble of any kind. We pray for the poor, the hungry, the imprisoned, the victims of ongoing war, and all who live in terror's wake. We ask your blessing on the children and the children's children of all of the formerly enslaved peoples of this country on this Juneteenth, and that you would continue to reveal to each of us the ongoing systemic racism in our country. May we as individuals, as a community, and as a country be willing to pay the cost, whatever cost, for justice, and to walk boldly into the unknown that we might reflect your coming kingdom of justice and peace, Lord, in your mercy. Your son, Jesus, was raised by Joseph, the carpenter, who saw him grow year by year in strength and wisdom. 
And Jesus himself neither married nor raised children of his own, but he helped countless people come and mature to fullness of life. We give thanks to you for all those who step into the role of father for those who are not their biological children. We are grateful today for stepfathers, for uncles, grandfathers, big brothers, neighbors, teachers, coaches, and all others who father us out of love. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we pray for all fathers. Give them wisdom, patience, and dedication. Grant them strength to persevere when children bring tears as well as laughter, anxiety as well as hope, pain as well as pleasure. Make your comforting presence known to those fathers who question their ability to cope or fear that they have failed. Those striving to offer support or feel they have nothing to give, comfort them, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Comforting God, hear our prayer for fathers and children who on this Father's Day feel pain instead of joy. Those whose fathers have died, those orphaned as children, those who have been mistreated, rejected, abused, and those from broken homes who barely see or know their fathers. And bring peace to fathers who have lost children or who are estranged from their children. Bring them your peace, which surpasses all understanding. Enfold them in your love. Lord, in your mercy. God of hope, we lift up all of the prayers on the hearts of this congregation, both those that have been spoken and those that have gone unspoken. We give you special praise and mercy for Buzz and Jenny who have reached the incredible milestone of 62 years. And we celebrate and thank you for their faithful witness in this community and among all of those who they know. And we pray that they might have ongoing many more years of joy and love and celebration of life together. And we pray for the mission sewing meeting that will be taking place. We pray that there might be newcomers and that you would bless all of the sewing and all of the fellowship that happens in that place, that you might use those hands that are working in your name. And at the end of this program year, we give special thanks for Carol Houghton and her many, many, many hours of hard work to make such beautiful praise and joy in this space. And for the faithfulness of all of the members of the choir and the bell choir and the pianist, Mary Ann, thank you for this congregation. You. In your songs, you tell us to sing a new song to the Lord. And because of these faithful people, that happens each and every Sunday. And so we give you thanks and praise for them, that they might have many, many more years of faithful ministry in your name. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And finally, God, we pray the prayer that you, the Father of all fathers, our everlasting Father, taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We invite you now to contemplate one way that you share your gifts with the church, whether that is through a financial contribution or through a contribution of your time. The offering plates are available if you do wish to drop in a gift.
Blessings of this and all our days. We thank, thank you, gracious God. God. Accept, Accept our, our gifts, not, not just in the place, but through, but through our talents, offered in gratitude for all you have done for us. You use, use them both in this place and wherever you might take us. Amen.